Hello, and thanks everyone for coming to this presentation and supporting me in this endeavor. And thank you, Dr. Meyer, for the wonderful introduction. I'd like to talk to you about my research entitled, What Can We Learn from Cyber Tracking? Applications of an International Tracker Evaluation System for Professional and Citizen Science and the Theory of Original Wisdom. Before we talk about my actual research, we need to set a foundation and establish what is tracking. To many people, this is the identification of a random footprint. It can also be the interpretation of a crime scene, such as a break into a house or even a poaching incident in the field. Also, many people envision a First Nations people such as from Africa or Native America or another country or continent following a continuous string of footprints to find an animal in hunting. Tracking is all of those things. It is identifying tracks, which are footprints, spore, or pug marks in other countries. They can be whole or partial, fresh or weathered. It's also identifying indirect field signs, which include, but are not limited to, feces, urinations, visual markings like rubs, scent marking, kill sites, browse evidence, body parts such as skulls or other skeletal remains, feathers, eggs, nests, webs, cocoons, exuviae, beds, dens, burrows, and etc., etc., etc. Identification of many of these things depends on the actual morphology of the structure of the track, the animal's feet, or the field sign. They also re require some degree of interpretation, especially gates and track patterns or ways of moving, and even particular smells, vocalizations, and alarm calls. Track aging is a hugely important complex and varied component of tracking, which also depends on substrate and weather analysis. And of course, using all of the above to follow a trail and find its maker, whether it's for hunting or not. In short, trackers identify, interpret, and follow tracks and signs to find animals and sometimes humans. We do this with the smallest of mammals to the big ones. Birds, reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, natural occurrences such as grasses or leaves blowing in the wind or lightning strikes on trees, and even human tracks and signs, including mechanical apparatus that humans operate. It's important to consider human tracks and signs and natural occurrences like grasses blowing in the wind because we need to be able to differentiate them from mammal signs or animal signs. So why track at all? In Africa, tracker is an occupation in the hunting and safari industries currently reserved for tribal men. It's something that all human cultures have historically done for food and safety, and some individuals were better than others. Today, some people still hunt for food, but fewer cultures overall retain this skill due to modernization, and some individuals are better than others. Yet we assume that all indigenous individuals are expert trackers, and we assume that all biologists are expert trackers and that tracking is so easy that anyone can do it. This is problematic in science where tracking is a fundamental aspect of international ecological research. Track-based data are used to determine where animals are, how many of them there are, what they need to survive and thrive, and how their presence affects the ecosystem. Results from track-based data are also used in conservation and management decisions. We should know that poor quality data yields poor quality results and potentially damaging conservation and management decisions. Yet tracker skill goes mostly unreported. My research questions were, how has tracking and track-based data been used in science? 
Does tracking require direct experience to become skilled, and how much? Are some tracking scenarios more complex than others, requiring a more skilled tracker to identify or interpret them? Are some individuals more skilled trackers than others, including among indigenous peoples and trained biologists? Does experience matter more than culture or occupation? How does a person go about becoming an expert tracker? I chose to answer these questions by exploring the reliability and characteristics of people who participate in the only international tracker evaluation system in the world. That system is known as CyberTracker. CyberTracker was initially developed in the 1990s by Louis Liebenberg in Southern Africa when he was working with the San Peoples of the Kalahari. He developed it first as icon-based software so that non-literate trackers could use their skill and take a palm top computer out into the field and push a picture of an animal that would lead them through a sequence of screens that allowed them to enumerate, enumerate animals or describe behaviors. It was also GPS located. There were problems, however. Some trackers were better than others. There were errors in the data associated with observation skill. So the idea for a tracker evaluation system was born. At the same time, Louis published a field guide to the animal tracks of Southern Africa, where he detailed the tracks and signs of the animals that were typically found. This reference became the standard which all animal tracks and signs were described against in field evaluations. Additionally, spores spore ratings were developed or criteria for the complex complexity of each track and they were published on the CyberTracker website. Still today you can find these there and they are continually updated according to the information that evaluators get from the field. CyberTracker has become international in scope growing far beyond Southern Africa. The tracker evaluation system is divided into two tracks. The track and sign aspect seen here in red and the trailing aspect seen here in yellow. They start at the bottom of the larger period pyramids where a participant, if they take the field evaluation and do not score at least a 70%, they are considered not yet competent. The scoring goes up from there to track and sign level one, which is 70 to 79 percent, level two, 80 to 89, level three, 90 to 99, and professional or level four, as it used to be called, at 100 percent. These pyramids in the lower part of this diagram are used to be called the lower band evaluations. They are now called secondary evaluations. Once a participant achieved 100% in the secondary evaluation or professional level, they were invited to attend the much more rigorous track and sign specialist evaluations or tertiary evaluations. These are based on a pass fail basis. So if a person does not achieve 100% or specialist, they are not yet competent at the specialist level. They are, however, not demoted from their professional status in the lower band or secondary evaluations. A combination of track and sign specialist and trailing specialist make, makes one a senior tracker. Master Tracker is an honorary designation that is bestowed upon people who have been a senior tracker for 10 or more years and contributed significantly to the field of tracking. Track and sign identification and interpretation is often compared to learning the ABCs of a language. They are the fundamental building blocks to tracking literacy. 
Trailing or following animal tracks and signs to find the animal is further compared to becoming literate, to forming words, sentences, paragraphs, and stories of an animal's life in the ecosystem it dwells in. And to give you an idea of what a track and sign evaluation looks like, questions, 50 questions are circled or marked in the field. Participants go up to them one by one or in small groups, and they cannot use books or rulers or speak to each other about the questions. They must use their own knowledge to answer each question. If they are literate, they write their answers down in a notebook. If they're not literate, they are able to approach the evaluator and describe what they are seeing. The evaluator writes what the people are answering down on a clipboard. Then when everyone is done with a section of questions, it might be four or five questions in a section until you reach 50, each section is discussed in detail. And if each person has said a different answer, it becomes an opportunity for learning the different tracks and signs and why something is what it is and is not what it isn't. Again, the reference, reference standard in Africa was originally Louis's book. It's grown far beyond that, though, with m many other publications being released in recent years. However, the evaluators still must approve the material, and it must be added to the SPOR rating sheet before it can be considered a question. This often means that it needs to be taught for several years, either as a teaching moment or outside of an evaluation before it gets added to the SPOR ratings lists. In lower band or secondary track and sign evaluations, evaluators give each question a point rating based on its complexity. A one point question is considered to be of simple complexity. A two point question is of medium complexity and a three point question is complex. 50 questions are asked where 20% of them are one point questions, 60% are two point questions, and 20% are three point questions. Questions are listed down the left margin of the score sheet. Point ratings are assigned in the next three columns before the questions are asked. Names of participants are listed across the top. The participant's answers are then entered in the appropriate column and row. So here, Martin's answers go in each row for his column and so forth for the other participants. Check marks are used for correct answers. X's are used for incorrect answers and the incorrect response is recorded for review. The point ratings work like this. If Martin gets a one point question correct, he gets one check. Whereas if Isaac gets the same question wrong, he gets three crosses. Thus, for a question deemed to be of simple complexity, Martin is rewarded little for getting it correct and Isaac is penalized heavily for getting it wrong. With a three point or complex question, if Martin gets it incorrect, he only gets one X and is penalized minimally, whereas if Bienza gets it right, he gets three checks and is rewarded heavily. Two-point or medium complexity questions, which remember comprise 60% of the questions asked, are worth two checks for getting them correct or three cr two crosses for getting them wrong. At the end of the evaluation, scores are calculated by dividing the number of points correct, the check marks, by the number of points correct plus incorrect, the checks plus the crosses, and multiplying by 100 to get a percent. The specialist or tertiary level track and sign evaluations are more difficult because only 53 point or complex questions are asked. In the past, though, a small number of two-point questions were allowed, but this has since changed. Also, in specialist evaluation, evaluations, there are seven bonus questions asked. Getting three bonus questions correct cancels out one incorrect three-point question. 
so a participant can get up to two regularly scoring three-point questions wrong and still achieve 100%. Getting a bonus question wrong does not penalize the participant. Bonus questions are extremely complex but not unreasonable. They are often small, old, partial, unusual, or weathered tracks, or tracks or signs that have be only been taught and asked in the system for a few years after their publication. In trailing evaluations, the essence is to trail a dangerous animal and find it without it knowing you are there. At the secondary level, hoofed or hard-footed animals are followed, such as rhinos, moose, buffalo bulls, or even deer. At the more difficult specialist level, soft-footed animals are followed, such as leopards, lions, or bears. Evaluators assign a point rating, similar to the complexity rating for the track and sign evaluation, to the trail. In an area where the ground is soft and the trail is easy to see far ahead, the trail is at a one point or simple complexity. The point ratings increase from there up to a point where evaluators might not score it, considering it too complex to follow under the conditions. There are five major categories where the participant is scored with consideration for the complexity of the trail. Those are spore recognition, spore anticipation, anticipation of dangerous situations, alertness, and stealth. Under each major category are five subpoints. Participants are given a score of between five and 10 points for each subpoint out of 250 possible points. Not every subpoint needs to be observed and scored in every evaluation but evaluators need to see enough to know that the participant can follow a trail at the complexity that they are scored and they need a successful encounter in order to achieve the professional level and move to specialist. In the first chapter that I'm going to talk about here, I searched for, scrutinized, categorized, and scored as many published papers as I could find looking for some measure of reported observer skill when scientists had based research outcomes on track-based data. These are the steps that I took. In my search strategy, I found 579 papers for review. I selected 421 of them. I extracted the data from each article, analyzed it, interpreted it, and discussed it but we're gonna focus on step four here. In step four, I analyzed the data from each publication and put them into categories. In category A, the data reliability was based on the observer, the mentor, or a combination of observer and mentor experience or skill. Papers were scored into subcategories, ranging from negative one if it lacked evidence to plus one if it gave evidence of observer reliability. In category B, data reliability was based on concurrent verifiable observance records, such as DNA or camera traps. For example, an unverified observer collecting scats in a presence absence study for a species would verify at least a small subsample of their data with camera traps or DNA. There were as many subcategories in B as there were concurrent technologies, and placement in any of these resulted in a plus one. In category C, data reliability was not required or was inherent to the system under study, such as in a closed population, a zoo, laboratory, or fenced population, for example. Papers in subcategories for C were given a score from zero to one. Papers could be scored in more than one category, but not more than one sub subcategory for each major category. Along the bottom axis of this graph are the categories A, B, and C. Along the left axis is the count of papers. What's most important here 
is that out of 312 papers scored in category A, where track-based data were collected by an observer, only 12 of these papers gave evidence for the skill of the observer. And these are the subcategory scores. The overall trend is that negatively scoring papers have some potential pitfall with the observers collecting the data and scores and reliability will go up from there with more positively scoring papers having more documented accountability of observer skill and or concurrent validation from some form of technology. And those 12 papers are here in the upper scoring range. My results were from 88 years of papers from 1931 to 2019. They were from 56 different countries, the top producing countries being the USA, Canada, and South Africa. Most research was conducted in the field with wild animals, but 190 papers were not. They were from labs, zoos, or collections. 153 species and several taxonomic groupings, such as large carnivores or macropods, were studied. The three most studied species included pumas, foxes, and martens. 199 described research requiring the identification of signs, 154 tracks, and 68 used a combination of wildlife tracks and signs yet only 12 articles provided evidence for the training observers received or a measure of their skill. So if tracking is a specific skill that requires focused training and practice, and when concurrent validation methods are not used, observer experience with collecting track-based data should be described. And cyber tracker evaluations are known to be a fast and reliable method to describe observer experience. But how do we know this? This led me to my next chapter. Here, I took score sheets from 10 years of track and sign evaluations in South Africa and analyzed them for who gets what correct versus incorrect. I added generalized categories of tracks and signs, such as tracks versus scats, hoofed versus padded foot animals, and demographic information from surveys, such as the gender of the tracker and their community. And I compared evaluation data with camera trapping data, where trackers certified at different levels of skill told me what animals had walked in front of camera traps. As mentioned, one form of the data analyzed were from track and sign score sheets from 147 different evaluations, 1,027 different participants, 323 unique questions, and 429 unique answers. In addition, there were 141 surveys, including more descriptive information about participants. The other data set came from camera traps. I set two camera traps per station where a station was a sand road or a game trail. I brought trackers of different cyber tracker certification levels by each station once a day and they told me what had walked in front of the cameras. I wrote down their answers in a field notebook and later compared it with the photographs that were caught on the camera traps. I swept the stations every 24 hours or after the trackers had told me what had walked through so that every day the tracks were fresh. This was in seven different venues over three field seasons. I used 111 certified trackers in 82 days of camera trapping. 120 different species were photographed and 133 different answers were given. This table shows the percent of questions answered correctly. They decrease with increasing complexity and increase with tracker level in both evaluations seen in the blue box and in camera trapping or photo data sets seen in the purple box. Sample sizes are shown in the red ovals at the bottom, 
with 49,999 questions for evaluation data and 7,320 questions for photo data. The table is further divided by into evaluation levels, secondary level trackers at the top and specialist level trackers at the bottom. Note that there are small numbers of bonus questions in the secondary level evaluations because some experimentation occurred during the evolution of the evaluation process. Similarly, at the specialist level, simple complexity questions were not asked, but some medium complexity or two-point questions were asked when conditions were so difficult that all three-point questions could not be found. Finally, note that this tracker level between the secondary and the specialist evaluations is made up of trackers who achieved professional at the secondary level but attempted and had not yet achieved specialist in the more rigorous tertiary evaluation. What we see here is that as point rating goes up, the percent of questions correct goes down. So an unrated participant gets over 80% of one-point questions correct, but only 59% of two-point and 40% of three-point. We see the same trend for level one, two, three, and professional, where professionals get 99% of one-point qu point questions correct, and this decreases by a few points to 95% of three-point questions correct. We also see an increasing percent of questions correct as we go down the table through increasing tracker levels by point rating. So unrated trackers get 82% of one point questions correct while professional level get 99% correct. Similarly, unrated trackers get 40% of three question, point questions correct while professionals get 95% correct. In the specialist evaluations, specialists get 94% of three-point questions correct and 78% of bonus questions. While this looks like an apparent decrease in percent correct between professional and specialist level trackers, we have to remind ourselves that the majority of questions asked at the specialist level are more complex. Without point ratings, because I was not yet an evaluator and could not assign them in the camera trapping part of this study, we do see that the same trend is in the photo data, where a level one gets 71% of questions correct overall, and the percentage increases through professional at 94% to specialist at 98%. This is a three-dimensional plot showing the interaction between tracker levels and point ratings and the impact they have on getting questions correct in an evaluation. On the right, we have in the increasing prob probability of getting a question correct from bottom to top. On the lower right axis, we have tracker level increasing from left to right. And on the lower left, we have point rating increasing from left to right. What we see is that down here in the blue, the interaction of high complexity questions with lower level trackers and a low incident of getting those questions correct. As we move up the plot, we are going up in tracker level and down in question complexity with increasing incidence of question correctness. In this line plot, we compare the performance of different levels of trackers in getting questions correct from evaluations with those in the camera trapping portion of the study. On the left is increasing percent correct from bottom to top. On the bottom axis is increasing tracker level starting from zero or not yet competent on the left and going right to levels one, two, three, four, which is professional, five, which is not yet specialist, and six, which is specialist. 
The blue line is the increasing percent of correct answers that each level of tracker scored in evaluations with evaluator validation. The orange line is the increasing percent of correct answers that each level of tracker scored by telling me the species who left the tracks in the camera plots with my interpretation of the photos as validation. The way the orange line closely mirrors the blue line shows that evaluators are likely correct in those species when they are evaluating and teaching them. Note the dip in the blue line and the gap in the orange line. This is where professional level participants have attempted the more rigorous specialist evaluation. And because they remain professional status, it pulls the orange line down at professional or four and then it jumps up to the specialist level in the plot. The numerical results reported in my written dissertation include the Pearson correlation tests and the binary log logistic regression values, which included the significant tests at a p-value of 0.05, the coefficients, the standard errors of the coefficients, the z-values, the 95% confidence intervals, the variance inflation factors, the odds ratios, and the model fits and predictive ability. But I am not going to indicate all of those here in the next slides, but only those that were significant and their interpretations. First, in my binary logistic regression model, the dependent variable was the answer given whether it was correct or incorrect for an evaluation question or a camera trapped species. Independent variables included the tracker level and the question complexity. These variables were created by categorizing the data in different ways to try and see if I could pull out more specific information about which questions were more difficult than others. And these variables were from the survey instruments, whether or not a participant was indigenous, what gender they were, the community that they came from specifically, and their years of experience. If we look at the model for the evaluation data set, again, the dependent variable was the answer given and the independent variables that were significant and their interpretations included tracker level, where across all levels, higher tracker levels are more likely to answer questions correctly. Question complexity or point rating. Across all point ratings, more complex questions are less likely to be answered correctly. Type. Track questions were the most likely to be answered correctly, while questions about scats, other signs and interpretations were less likely to be answered correctly. Size, larger tracks are identified correctly more frequently than smaller tracks. Social structure, species with a recognizable social structure are more likely to be answered correctly. Common, questions about common species are more likely to be answered correctly than questions about uncommon ones. These results don't seem terribly surprising. But when we look at the predictive ability of the binary logistic regression model, we see that it's incredibly low with an adjusted R-square of only 14.26%. Reducing the model to all but the two variables that contributed the most, tracker level and question complexity, only decreased the model fit to an adjusted R-square of 12.99%. Then when we look at the photo data set, again, the de dependent variable in the model was the answer given, and the independent variables that were significant and their interpretations were also tracker level, where across all levels, higher tracker levels are more likely to answer questions correctly. Size, larger tracks are identified correctly more frequently than smaller ones. Common, questions about common species are more likely to be answered correctly than questions about uncommon ones. A surprising variable was indigenous, where non-indigenous trackers were more likely to answer a question correctly. And I explored that more in the last chapter that we're going to talk about today. 
experience. Trackers with more experience answered more questions correctly. Again, these results don't seem terribly surprising, except for maybe the indigenous variable. But when we look at the predictive ability of the binary logistic regression model, we see it's also very low, with an adjusted R-square of 19%. And reducing the model to all but the two variables that contributed the most, which were years experience and tracker level, it decreased the model fit to 14%. So how is it that descriptive statistics can show us so clearly that tracker level does have an effect on whether or not a person gets a question correct, as well as the complexity of the question or the amount of experience that a person has, and yet the predictive ability of the model is so low? Some of this could be explained by confounding effects of substrate and weather which are variables that I didn't measure. Or how many years a question has been asked and taught and at what point rating. For example, when antlion pitfall trap and trail became a question, it was something that very few trackers had actually looked at in terms of an evaluation question. It began as a very complex question. And over the years, it was asked and taught so many times that it became a very simple question in complexity. So then looking at a question, do we deem the complexity based on the question itself or on how common it is to be seen and how many times it's been taught or what we think other people should know? The volume of potential questions and variability of potential answers is huge. If we just look at the questions that were asked here and their potential point ratings, there's a lot, and there's a lot more that were not asked in this evaluation. Maybe all of that variability is just too great for the model to handle. Point rating captures some variability, but is limited to four selections. Perhaps there should be more. Perhaps there should be more defining characteristics of the questions that we're asking. And tracker level also contains a range of score. What's the difference between a 70% and a 79% in terms of skill? And is a 79 closer to a 70 or an 82 in skill? We're putting these levels into baskets of tracker level one from 70 to 79, tracker level two from 80 to 89. But what if the basket is somewhat different? Important here are differences, potential differences among the evaluators. A newer evaluator might ask questions without one clear answer or unfair questions or questions at a different point rating than a more experienced evaluator. Similarly, a more experienced evaluator must use caution that their experience does not lead them to rate questions as more or less complex than they actually are. It's important for evaluators to meet regularly to avoid these types of scenarios. Or is it something else that was not measured? The conclusion remains that experience matters. And finally, in the last chapter that I'm going to describe, I interviewed trackers from the Shangan community near Kruger Park in South Africa, white South Africans and trackers from the USA to discover trends in their perceptions of tracking and their obstacles, opportunities, and techniques to become a successful and skilled tracker. A theory emerged that supported a collaborative culture of trackers instead of separate cultures who track where traditional ecological knowledge is actually being preserved and extended by Western knowledge systems. In my interviews with CyberTracker certified trackers, I used grounded theory. Grounded theory research is the study of abstract problems and their processes. Constructivist grounded theory allows researchers to include their own experience to co-construct a theory to explain these. 
As a highly experienced tracker, studying people who are expert trackers, my goal was to discover their emergent problems and their resolutions for managing their journey to become an expert tracker within the cyber tracker system. Steps in constructivist grounded theory include interviews and transcriptions, initial coding and recoding of texts, creating memos that describe, sort, and link ideas, and identifying limitations, gaps, and future research. This occurs until a saturation point is attained and no new information emerges. Then a theoretical outline is developed and any existing literature is consulted. Interviews took place in South Africa and the USA with additional data collected via telephone and through the internet. The sample included 38 certified trackers. 28 were South African, 14 Shangan, 10 Americans. There were five women, no Shangan, two South Africans, and three Americans. There were two documented incidences of traditional ecological knowledge among Shangan trackers, one regarding a rodent burrow and another with a caterpillar. Both were examples of historical food resources. Two major groups of trackers emerged, full-time trackers, or FTTs, employed in the ecotourism industry, and part-time trackers, or PTTs, who participated in tracking as one aspect of their occupation or for their own recreation. Both groups had different obstructions and opportunities, but told similar stories about the process of tracking and how to become an expert tracker, especially using the cyber tracker system. For example, older FTTs traditionally grew up tracking during the apartheid era, herding the family livestock as children instead of going to school. As adults, they were hired as trackers within game reserves to find animals for guests to photograph. Thus, tracking was a job in most cases and not a passion, and they became more competent in trailing before track and sign because they did it every day. Remember we talked about that indigenous variable in our model, and why were non-indigenous trackers more likely to answer a question correctly? Perhaps this is the answer. Their children are no longer learning tracking through herding but attending school and moving away for jobs. Because education is poor and jobs are scarce, they often move back and become trackers, receiving on the job training from older trackers, guides, and through certification provided by the cyber tracker system or mentorship provided by its evaluators. PTTs of all ages generally spent free time in nature as children and had access to resources that facilitated interest and learning about nature. They received adequate, excellent educations, but there were no job opportunities to become trackers. Tracking was often a passionate interest alongside a different career, and they became more competent in track and sign before trailing because they did it every day. Again, going back to the indigenous variable in our model. The emergence of myriad texts and, texts and teachers through CyberTracker has provided them with mentorship and evaluations are seen as a means to pursue excellence in learning. There were four major categories that emerged from trackers in this research. First, what it means to be a tracker. Second, developing the skill. Three, cyber tracker and certification of expertise. And four, obtaining mastery. These categories are summarized and illustrated with representative quotes from a tracker or multiple trackers from the different cultures studied in my dissertation. I describe how trackers in the greater Kruger region of South Africa might reflect a global transition away from tracking as isolated pockets of traditional ecological knowledge within small subgroups of indigenous people to a revival and growth among a much broader demographic of people that spans continents and cultures. I propose the culture of tracking as opposed to cultures that track in a constructivist grounded theory where tracking is original wisdom. This table shows the foundational concepts of the theory of original wisdom as emerged from the interviews with trackers. I want to focus on number four and five.
Number four says tracking is an original wisdom. It's original in that it's old and was wisdom practiced by all first peoples relating to food and safety. Some of this information might be exclusive to a land or a culture based on regional species and substrates, but the concepts and processes for learning are universal. And number five, tracking is an original wisdom. It's original in that it's new and is wisdom practiced by modern peoples for recreational uses that include resources and technologies that push the boundaries of what's possible to know much further than for food and safety. I'd like to thank Lee and Manoa for mostly quietly enduring the time away from each other that this journey has taken. To my parents, John and Donna Grott, for always giving me the trust and freedom to wander off and explore the wild spaces around me as a child, and for loving and supporting me unconditionally throughout my life. This work would not have been possible without the guidance and patience of my advisor, Professor Thomas Meyer. It's been a joy to work with such an incredibly talented and caring individual. Thanks to all the statistical experts I've consulted with over the years, including Patrick Joyce, Brian Bader, and Professor Ming Hui Chen from the Center for Applied Statistics at UConn, Sartaj Singe at Code Mentor, and Dr. Robert Ricard for introducing me to the rich environment of qualitative and human dimensions analysis. This work is dedicated to all the trackers who I worked with and studied alongside across the world during this adventure and the many lodges and reserves who support those in South Africa, and especially to Louis Liebenberg, who developed the CyberTracker Tracker Certification System and continues to refine it and to travel to remote places and identify and uplift talented trackers. Together with master trackers Adrian Lowe and Dr. Mark Elbrock, they brought it to the rest of the modern world. And finally, to the animals who make the tracks that trackers identify, interpret, and follow in order to find them. Thank you for listening, and now I'll take questions.